Hello and welcome everyone to episode 45 of the Drunken Boxing Podcast, coming at you once again from the capital of the Middle Kingdom, Beijing. I have returned to Beijing a couple of days ago, since leaving in early December. It's been a long but good trip abroad, where I visited my family that I was unable to see for the last three years due to the lockdowns and restrictions over here. I know I promised to release new programs, etc. on the Mushin Martial Culture YouTube channel, But due to problems with daily power cuts where I was predominantly based in South Africa, I was unable to work on projects while there. I was also in New York for the last part of my trip though, and I did go visit a few martial artists who have been guests on previous episodes of the Drunken Boxing Podcast, such as Richard Amos and Vincent May. And you can expect some new videos regarding this to be coming out in the near future. Of course, I will be continuing with the Bagua Zhang history series, including the previously promised video on the Tomb of the Arts founder, Dong Ai Chuan. I'm sure all the upcoming content and videos, etc. will make the prolonged wait all worth it. All in all, now that I'm back home, you can expect much in the way of interesting content to be coming out regularly and soon. Alright, once again, I would like to highlight the Mushin Martial Culture Patreon page. This is one way to support the Drunken Boxing Podcast and all the Mushin Martial Culture endeavors in general. There are general support tiers to do just that, and any and all support is really appreciated. It is really the only way that I can continue to do these endeavors that I do is with your support. Much of the endeavors I do are very time consuming and they require a lot of energy to finish. So um, any and all support that you guys are able to give me is highly appreciated and just helps me to continue doing what I'm doing. Additionally, on Patreon, there's a third tier, the Hua Jin tier, through which you can study the arch of Hebei, Xing Yichuan, and Liang style Ba Gua Zhang in depth. There is an extremely large library of lesson videos available, and there are new ones being added on a regular basis. These cover technical instruction, skill building practices, neigong or internal skill building practices, partner work as well as application, and lessons on theory as well. The content is all professionally produced, it's in-depth, it's clear, and it's an effective way to learn. So if you don't have a teacher close by and were, or were interested in learning these arts, this is one way to do it. You may find the program and the support tiers at patreon.com forward slash Mushin Martial Culture. That's Mushin Martial Culture, all one word. Another way to support the podcast and the channel in general is by purchasing some of the Mushin Martial Culture merchandise, which is available through our Teespring store. There are many different items available for you to display your love of these arts, and you may check them out at the link listed here and in the notes. You can look out for some new merchandise that will be coming out in the next few months too. Okay, let's get into today's podcast. My guest today is Rory Knapp Fisher, who hails from Victoria, British Columbia. Rory has been training in the martial arts for over 20 years and has a background in Okinawan, Gojuru, Karate, as well as Shingi Chuen. He has been a direct lineage disciple under Yang Yusen in the Zhezong lineage of Gao style Ba Gua Zhang since 2009. He's a registered acupuncturist with an emphasis on orthopedic practice in Victoria, British Columbia, as well as an in-demand lecturer and instructor on acupuncture and Chinese medicine. I first met Rory through his training brother, Jesse Conley, who has been an online friend for a number of years already. They both accompanied their teacher, Yang Yusen, on a trip to their Gao Bagua family here in Beijing some years ago. While many people are familiar with the Yizong Gao style Bagua Zhang lineage coming through Taiwan, the Beijing Zhezong lineage is relatively less mainstream. Rory is a dedicated martial arts practitioner with a wealth of knowledge on traditional Chinese medicine, and I enjoyed chatting to him about these subjects. So with that, I give you Rory Knapp Fisher. Okay, welcome to the Drunken Boxing Podcast, Rory Knapp Fisher. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Byron. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm doing well, thanks. Glad we could finally get this done. It's been a bit of a, a bit of an issue to get this set up from my end with, with the different locations I've been in, but I'm glad we're finally getting this done now. Yeah, I mean, I think it worked out better, actually, because you being in New York, you're in New York still, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, that's probably easier than trying to do this from Beijing. Oh, yeah. In terms of time, for sure, for sure. Yeah, one of us is staying up past our bedtime that way, for sure. Exactly, exactly. Well, before we get into it, I know you through a mutual acquaintance, uh, Jesse. Um, yeah. So before we get into it, maybe you could introduce yourself and uh, to the listeners there. Sure. Yeah. Um, so as yeah, I, I'm, my name is Rory. Um, I am a. I guess I, I. I would say I'm a Bagua practitioner, a practitioner of Gao, Gao style Bagua Zhang. Um, 
specifically in the somewhat lesser known Zhuzong lineage of Bagua Zhang. So um, I, my, my teacher, my shifu is Yang Yusin, um, in here in Victoria, BC, and I've been with him for ooh, going on about 14 years now. Okay. Um, got a, I mean, yeah, and as, as we all do, I kind of came to Bagua a little bit later in my martial arts training, relatively speaking. But uh, yeah, beyond that, I, I, don't know, I don't know what else you want to know. Do you want to know me in general or me as a No, no, that's, that's a good place to start. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into little okay. bits and pieces of, of, your, of your history as we go. Yeah. So yeah, most people are familiar with Gao style predominantly out of Taiwan. Um, I think it's yeah. most popular. It's probably the most popular style of Bagua practiced in Taiwan. And most Western exposure to Gao style came through that uh, pathway out of cool. people that cool. Yeah, of course, yeah. So maybe you could give a bit of a background on Gao style and, um, you know, uh, where it comes from, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I should probably preface everything that I'm going to say about Bagua uh, in that I'm, I'm somewhat cloistered in, in a lot of regards in the martial arts world uh, in a big way. Um, so unlike a lot of my Gong Fu brothers who have spent a lot of time in, in various Chinese martial arts, for in some cases decades, I basically, I, I had about six to eight months of uh, Xing Yi under my belt before meeting uh, Yang Shifu. And um, basically everything that I have learned about Bagua and internal martial arts and Northern Chinese martial arts are very much through um, like my, ex my my experience in, within that. So I, I tend to be very, uh, somewhat ignorant about some of the wider picture of things. So, okay. um, so just as, as, as a disclaimer. Uh, but anyways, um, the the style that, that we practice, it's, uh, yeah, like I said, it's the, the Juzong lineage, which is the lineage that comes down through uh, Wu Mingxia, who was one of Gao's um, earlier disciples. I believe actually his first, mm -hmm. his first like, like, you know, true, true disciple. Um, and so Wu Meng Xia's lineage came out of primarily Tianjin and Beijing later. And Wu Meng Xia is a fairly well-known martial artist, I, I believe, in the in the internal martial arts world, um, you know, relatively speaking. Um, the specific lineage that uh, I've been, you know, ha you know, privileged enough to be exposed to came through Wu Meng Xia as well as one of his one of Wu's Gong Fu brothers, a guy named Bi Mo Tang. Uh, who was not a particularly um, like, you know, like act like publicly active martial artist. He was actually a pretty uh, pretty busy businessman running an import company in Beijing. Mm. Um, but was uh, what, what what was like you know you know right alongside Wu. Apparently, they used to travel around uh, China quite a bit back in the day. Um, you know, testing their their stuff out on various uh, various other parties and whatnot. But whereas Wu became a pretty prominent teacher, and you know he like authored a book on on Taiji and was sort of well known for being a bit of like a you know like like a, like a tiger in the field, so to speak. Uh, Bi Mo Tang was relatively quiet, but uh, Bi Mo Tang's son Bi Tian Zuo and learned from his father for a period of time, and then from Wu for a period of time. Okay. Um, and same th same sort of thing. Like Bi Tian Zuo, not a super publicly active martial artist, but, um, you know, nonetheless, a very dedicated one. Mm. Um, he was an engineer, you know, he is an engineer, I guess he's, re he's retired now. Um, he, it was, uh, he, he was an engineer in, in Beijing. Um, I want to say in like the petroleum business, mm. I think <laughs> I might be wrong about that, okay. but you know, like long, long story short, um, Yusin, uh, my teacher, Yang, Yang Yusin, I just happened to be living in the same apartment complex with uh, with with Bt and well, um, in when he was like a teenager and just kind of you know as it happens was practicing martial arts one day and uh, Bt and well comes along and says what you doing and you know and, you know and, and so so that's how Yang Yusin became sort of exposed to it and uh, and that's basically the lineage up until you know my my generation of it but it's been a fairly small lineage almost going more from like you know very much like within like a family or like just like, like right. a couple of key a couple of key disciples um i think a while ago we actually tried to almost do the math on it of how many people there were like in the world <laughs> doing our exact lineage of bagua and we came yeah. up with maybe two dozen okay. um, 
So like much, much, much smaller. Um, there's never really been a major uh, like association or uh, any sort of like really public facing school or anything like that. So it's been relatively quiet, but nonetheless, it's attracted a handful of pretty dedicated people over the over the generations. Yeah, of course. And I mean, that doesn't it doesn't it's not necessarily a barometer of uh, styles. Uh, uh, abilities if they've set up something official or public or not that really doesn't it's, matter certainly so, not, no, not my experience well is there any connection between uh this lineage and han Musia? yes absolutely actually um i'm glad you asked me that because i might have might have missed that detail yeah um han, han Musha was actually one of wuming uh teachers oh okay so um you know the, the story of of gao gao bagua um, you know, and depending on the source you read, this gets kind of contested from time to time. But you know, the story that we hold in our lineage is that, you know, uh, Gao Yisheng was a student of, <clears throat> you know, a very brief student of Cheng Tinghua, and then I want to say he was a student of Zhang Zhaodong. Perhaps you might know better than I. Um, but you know, he was he was uh, practicing essentially uh, Cheng style Bagua for a while. Right. And the story that you know we we pass along is that you know as as it happens in these instances there was a wandering you know mysterious wandering figure who wanders by him one day as he's practicing named Song Yiren and says something to the effect of you know yeah you're not doing too bad with that but you're only scratching the surface yeah. and proceeds to show him uh, you know this this is the origin of what we have as like the the, the Ho Tien Bagua like the sixty four more like linear palms so to speak. And so that was where, you know, like that, that's kind of where like the, the Gao style, you know, has its sort of, you know, it's, it's like inception. But at the same time, um, Han Lu Xia was uh, in, you know, in less, in a way that I'm not quite as clear on, like also basically uh, versed in the same style. So um, Wu Ming Xia both was a, a student of Han Lu Xia and then um, later, when he met Gao, became a disciple of Gao's as well. And okay. while Han Lusha and Gao Yisheng never actually met, apparently they exchanged correspondences to basically say, like, you know, recognize each other and say, "Yep, we are, we're, we're doing the same thing." So there, so yeah, so they're almost like the two sort of like a, you know, like like paternal <laughs> figures of yeah, the, yeah. the system are are Gao and Han kind of equally through Wu Meng Xia. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, generally, you know, if, if the classification for Gao style is Cheng lineage Gao sub style, basically, you know, it's, yes, it's exactly, exactly. And and in terms of, uh, you know, your particular style uh, of Gao, have you had any interaction with other of the, the, the Gao stylists, the general ones coming out of the Taiwan lineages? Um, you know, very little. Uh, like I, again, I, I've I've typically been a little bit cloistered. I mean, there's there's not a lot of Bagua in my part of the world. Um, it, like at least on my little island right here. Um, I, so I, I mean, it's funny. I'm I'm actually like you know a hop, skip, and a jump away from Vancouver, where there's a ton of of Chinese oh. culture in general. Um, but I live in Victoria on Vancouver Island, where we you know we we boast the oldest Chinatown in the country, but it's a pretty small place and. There's not really a lot of Bagua. Um, you know, there's a few, th a few, a few people around, but no, no, uh, no Gao style that I'm, I've actually been familiar with. Oh, okay. So the uh, the Gao, the Yizong people that I've actually crossed paths with um, are coincidentally enough people who had studied under Luo or uh, Tim Cartmel in the past, um, or Marcus Brinkman. You know, some of his people who had like trained with you know one of those yeah. guys, and you know, and like. You know, eons ago, and then ended up uh, hooking up with Yusin at some point, and so kind of got some exposure to what the Yizong style was like via via them, kind of telling me what the big differences were. Mm. Um, and beyond that, honestly, like what I've seen in videos of people doing the Yizong lineage, but no real like deep discussion of uh, of different theory or anything, unfortunately. Right. What you've seen on video, though, I mean, is it uh, is there? Would you say, yeah, okay, that's that's recognizable, or yeah, I can. See oh yeah, that. yeah, 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 big time. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny, right? Because I mean, like, it's <clears throat> you you look around at martial arts in general, and when you have like a large style, especially one like Bagua, which has so many 
sub lineages and everything like that. Like, you know, the only really unifying thing is the circle walking practice. <laughs> and, 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 and even then, I mean, like, I don't know, like you, if you heard the joke, like how many internal martial artists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Mm. And you know, like 10, like one to screw in the light bulb and nine to say, we do this kind of different. <laughs> so true though isn't it yeah and usually smugly say we do this kind of different yeah exactly <laughs> like oh that's interesting i see you uh you turn it with a little more elbow movement hey yeah we we use our body uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um no yeah. no you're doing that wrong you're doing that wrong <laughs> yeah which is it, it, it turns out it usually just means like there's a different uh yeah a, a, a different principle of power generation that's being explored right yeah um, but no, I mean, from what I've from what I've like looked around and seen o over the years, like Yizong is the one that I you know always looks most recognizably Gao, and like you know I would uh, and like it, the, the, not only in the uh, the actual uh, like movements, like the palm changes and everything itself, like the the whole s structure of the system is virtually identical to Jizong. Um, it looks like they there's a few things that are rearranged. Um, for instance, in the 64 linear palms, which is like the Hotian portion of the system, mm. they basically have all all of the exact same forms, but they just ordered them slightly differently uh, in some of the more like like later later forms of them. Um, and you know, for whatever whatever reason, I I don't know. Uh, it's just that you know, it was almost like someone said, well, let's let's teach this one earlier. The, this, these ones actually go together better, you know, we think and. But you know, general form-wise, they are the same, the same movements, right? Like there's, we we have, uh, I don't know, we can. You want you want you want to talk about the structure of the system? <laughs> sure, go ahead, for sure. I was uh, gonna get into that anyway. That's one yeah, of the I wanted to ask. Yeah, I mean, I, I I should preface too that you know, if you get me talking about something, I tend to just keep running. No, no, do it because I mean, that's exactly what this podcast is supposed, yeah. to, supposed to be. People talking from the heart so if that's what you do then do it please yes yes um yeah with with pleasure um so yeah i mean the like the overall structure of the gao gao system you know unlike some of the other uh maybe might even call them like older or like you know sort of more like well-known styles of bagua where they have like the uh like the eight mother palms for instance uh -huh. we don't, yeah, yeah exactly we we don't we kind of have that in 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 gao but not as uh Explicit, or not, not as, not as a, uh, I don't know. There's, there's, we don't have eight of them. I guess is the best way to say it. Like when we, when we're learning the circle walking practice, we have two like preliminary, uh, like postures that we do it in, uh, right. which are basically just to teach like the two aspects of the stepping, right? Like the dung and the tongue. Um, you know, it's like the sinking the weight and then the accelerating forward to you know make the mud weighting step properly. But yeah. that once that's basically you know, acquired as a skill, you really just do the the uh, pretty, you know, quintessential uh, dragon stretches, claws posture, and yeah. you use the other ones almost more as like a supplementary thing when you want. Right. Um, so when you say dragon stretches, claws, you mean Tuemo Jung, the millstone, commonly called millstone pushing palm orientation. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we what was I going to say? So you know, so we have we have that, but then what we the way that the whole system is organized, like I mentioned, is we have this a very distinct division between the Xientian Bagua and the Hotian Bagua, and pre heaven and post heaven. Exactly, exactly, and it's divided like that with the um, very explicit design that the Xientian Bagua, the you know the, the the pre heaven or you know in in Chinese medicine this is, amounts to. The, Prenatal, right? Prenatal, is, exactly. Um, so, what you inherently, uh, uh, what's the word? Inherit from your world, parents, yeah, exactly. Genetically, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's the it's like the the prenatal portion of the system, and it's you know there there's obvious martial art aspects to it, like you know, essentially most of the major. Um, like throws and stuff that you see in the system come right out of that portion of the of of the practice, and all of the principles of structure and power generation, and you know, like Leo Hu gets trained in that. So you know, like how do you know the the coordination of the body to you know cleanly express the power, like all of that's there, mm. but it's not as like overtly tactical. Uh, okay. So the idea is. The Shantian is very much like you are more developing your body to yeah. perform Bagua properly. Okay. And that so, makes sense. It, yeah, which is, you know, why it's Shantian, right? And then the Hotian is like the, 
like the much more explicit like martial art applications of it. Yeah, but Hotian yeah. is all based on what you've developed in Xientian. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the way my teacher would always describe it is like you know the the kind of old school way of uh, you know of, of learning it like 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 the heated was you know he learned you know for a first year he was just doing circle walking and single palm change. Um, Don Huang Don, right? Um, yeah. Just doing that for a year, and then you know eventually once that became you know acceptable, uh, Bishuya shows him the second of the palm changes and so and then you know like you know, but you know, a few years spent on the shentian portion and then once that's you know good and you know those those principles are are like dialed into the tissues and everything has basically been conditioned and you know made turned into habit then learning the hotian palms is effectively very easy because you're learning these like the very simple forms like they're you know like the longest one of them Will take you about five seconds to run through. <laughs> like oh. they're, they're they're basically like um like they're almost a, akin to like the earlier like Wuxing Chuan from Xing Yi, right? Yeah, line uh, drills. Exactly, like just very very short short forms. But uh, as my my teacher would often say, like you know like it's the forms are are great, but the engine behind it is the Shantian. So if you don't have that engine, you're kind of just doing an empty shell of a movement. The thing that makes it real and you know and effective is having that movement principle that's developed from the shantian portion of the system well that's very so good for, i mean that's i mean that's how uh, even xingyi and even our system of bagua is is presented and uh, mm. a lot of people miss that i remember my teacher like having people come over to learn uh years ago and uh you know they'd be like after a week they're like no but i'm still doing this basic stepping and uh, my teacher's like yeah, I did like mother palms for five years before I yeah, did anything yeah. else, you know? <laughs> you're complaining after a week, you're already trying to do tang ni bu, you're already trying to learn mud wading stepping, you shouldn't even be doing that just yet, but you know, you're complaining about that, you know, so. I think, and, I think and, you told and, me that story when I was in Beijing. Uh, yeah, with, yeah, for sure. I think I did that end up having an encounter with a tree yeah he did uh, <laughs> i thought so <laughs> we'll leave that for a personal private discussion yeah, uh, for sure <laughs> but yeah exactly that and, and and people don't realize like you're trying to develop an engine you know yeah you, you, if you don't develop the engine i don't you, why do you even think about racing you're just you know you're you got a nice easy. looking car yeah you well not even that right? you know? <laughs> you're going to try try sitting uh, in a racing car with no engine. I mean, what's the point of that, right? So, yeah. yeah. It's for the gram, you know, it's just take, it's take uh, really nice selfies to post on social media, of course. Yes. Which, um, you know, is uh, a playful analogy, but unfortunately that's what a lot of our uh, our craft gets turned into these days. <laughs> right. right. Right, like, you know, like, you know, long form John Zhuang or circle walk or mud wading step doesn't make for a lot of likes on social media. Yeah. Um, like really dynamic, flourishy kicks do. Um, but, you know, is, is there that engine behind it, right? Is there, is, I mean, well, basically, is, is there gong fu there, right? Well, that's what we can see over time with practice. You know, when you practice yeah. these arts for a long time, when you see somebody doing even basic stuff, you're like, okay, he's got skill, he's developed all these aspects, even if he's just doing basic stuff. But then you get like, no, but we need to do a performance like for the public. And they don't, they don't want to see that because they don't know what they're looking at firstly. And for them, it's boring. I, I'm personally of the opinion that once you know what you're looking at, it's actually really interesting to look at the basic stuff not the flashy stuff yeah, absolutely absolutely yeah and like that you know that's um it's funny you say that too because being for like i i mean I, I said that i came into bagua relatively late but i mean and, and as soon as i said that i you know i remembered i was i was actually in my mid-20s when i when i when i met uh young Yusin. Mm. Um, so you know I, I said relatively late but i mean i've been doing martial arts since i was like in my kind of mid late teens so it felt late at the time, you know, that, that, that ignorance of being in your mid twenties is you think you're getting old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh man, I'm a. You started I'm, really late. How old are I'm, you? I'm going to be thirty in a few years. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wish. Uh, but no, I, it's like I, I, I can't remember who I heard say this, but I remember hearing somebody refer to Bagua Zhang as the graduate school martial art. And I, I honestly do not know where I heard that, or even if I heard it from multiple places. But that that really stuck with me when I heard heard that that phrase because it it occurred to me that you know the the people who you see 
who seem to really get it and kind of recognize it for what it is are people who have some uh, you know, some background, if not in like, you know, a more formal martial art, like, you know, at least being like kind of a scrappy, uh, you know, like shit disturber in their youth for back of a better yeah. word or something like that. Like, you know, they're like, they, they have that knowledge of, of like the, the, the environment of combat and what's kind of involved in, you know, in, in being good at it. And so when they see, you know, like the structural principles, uh, the rooting principles and things like that. Like, yeah, they are quote unquote boring because they're focusing on really small details, but there's an understanding of the importance of it, which doesn't necessarily come through if like, you know, you're a brand new, eager, you know, soon to be martial artist. And what you really want to do is like kick a heavy bag or get in the ring with someone or something like that. Well, I was actually having a conversation with a couple of Xinyi. Xinyi Liocha practitioners, you know, Xinyi Liocha Chen, Xinyi Henan, 10 yeah. big frame, uh, big, uh, you know, the the Muslim derived Xinyi. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he was saying, you know, when people come to him and ask him about uh, learning why they want to learn, uh, he'll ask them, why do you want to learn? And they'll be like, I want to learn how to fight. And then he'll be like, well, go do some boxing for six months. Yeah. You'll be able to fight. And uh, there's that. Like, if you want to do this stuff, if that's your only goal, it's, uh, you know, it, you're going to be putting in a lot of effort for a system that develops that, but not only that. So if that's all you want, just go do boxing, you know? Totally. Totally. And I can understand what he means. It's not, you know, he's an older gentleman. He's had a, a lot of experience in both training and teaching. And, and he's not trying to say that the art is not good for boxing. I mean, sorry, for fighting. What he's trying to say is, He's had the experience of people falling out, basically getting involved for the wrong reasons, putting in the efforts and then disappearing because um, it's it's not it's not in line with their only goal or their simple goal. If you've got a simple goal there's a simple solution, right? Uh, if you've got a more profound goal, well, these arts are more profound. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you know, as, as as you know, the the teacher in that circumstance, like it's exhausting. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, and like, like the, I mean, um, like you, 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 you've been teaching for for a while. I'm, I'm sure, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, and like I've, the yeah, amount of energy you put into to one person sometimes is, you know, it's like a lot of thought, a lot of, a lot of, like, uh, you know, a lot of effort, a lot of attention, yeah. and you know, like, like, you know, a, a lot of emotion goes into it, right? Because you know, if, so, if someone genuinely expresses the desire to learn, like you are kind of excited about that in, in, as, as, a, as a teacher. And then if they kind of suddenly say, hey, you know what, like I was into it for a while and I'm not really anymore. It's, <laughs> it's just like, it's draining. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, but it, it is, it is something that uh, we deal with all the time, even ourselves. Yeah. I, I mean, there, you, you'll go through plateaus through your training career. You'll be like, oh, I'm not getting anywhere. You know, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm worse than before. Uh, why am I doing this? You know, what am I actually trying to get here? And you, you know, if you you got to push through those little plateaus because those Absolutely. are normal. So, well, and, you know, and that's funny too because, like, I, you know, I'm I'm in like I'm I'm pushing forty now, and I actually was one of the things that has made me continuously like I, I know I, I was going to say like return to Bagua, but you know, I never I don't never really left. Like I was you know for whatever reason like very you know devoutly committed to it kind of from the get-go for a variety of reasons i think but you know like you said there's there's ebbs and flows there's t times when like you you're really inspired by your training um you're you're chomping at the bit to do more than there's times and you kind of feel like you're just sort of going through the motions and don't really know what you're, you're developing with it and stuff but the thing that i found to be the thing that always kind of renews that interest is like it's a different thing every time and in mm. certain like you know my my understanding of what the art does for me now is quite a bit different than what I thought than, than what I considered it doing for me when I was, you know, like 27. Um, yeah. And, you know, and like the part, part of that is just being at a different, you know, like when, when I was in, you know, my, my mid twenties and was like a little more, you know, like just wanted to bang arms and throw people around. Like, <laughs> you know, that was there and that was fun, but um but you know, you know, it's like I, I've, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if um, Jesse mentioned, but I mean, I, at my, I, I'm a, I'm a, an acupuncturist and a Chinese. Yeah, so we're gonna get into that too. So yeah, yeah. 
so it would and so like my my career like my profession has also been like studying um like injuries and the body and i've spent quite a lot of time uh specifically researching like fascial uh like you know like um like fascial anatomy that's a big yeah. part of my, my 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 work as a as a practitioner and it's funny because i you know, in, in doing that, I've, I've spent quite a lot of time looking at like very modern research in terms of understanding of how connective tissue responds to stimulus and, you know, pathology and training and all this kind of stuff. And there's all these very new, shiny methods of conditioning the body based on this kind of research. And every single time I get an understanding of one of them, I suddenly go, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. I think we have this in Bagua. Um, you know, and it, obviously it's like a slightly different, you know, maneuver or way of doing it. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things that I become, have become, con I become used to being astonished by it because it, every time it happens, it makes me think like just how complete the, these, these systems are in some ways. And there's things that are, you know, now finally being recognized in, you know, modern medicine that are not only being recognized, they're like, they're seamlessly blended into the training in this martial arts system that, you know, supposedly it's about, you know, 150, 200 years old. But, you know, when you look at the detail of it, it obviously has, you know, you know, it, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. There's a, there's a lot of research, a lot of development that went into yeah. it, you know, coalescing it as the Bagua Zhang that we know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the it was based on knowledge of previous styles and other yeah. aspects apart outside of martial systems and oh, combined yeah. into what we call Bagua with, of course, further additions to it. So, I mean, that's why the analogy of Xian Tian and Hou Tian is so apt, because you could say whatever styles and systems, you know, uh, Dong Hai Chuan practiced um, before he he made Bagua, that could be the Xian Tian of of Bagua and then his uh, his own uh, combination of that knowledge and then further refinement and development into whatever he taught there could be considered Ho Tian. You're taking something that you originally learned and knowledge that you have and then you're further refining and using you know your own experience to compile it into something that then gets handed down and that's I think where people also get kind of uh, stuck. They'll be like no but you can't change anything. No, yeah. you can, but make sure you've got all the absorption of the previous stuff first before you think about changing something, right? Yeah. So, keeping keeping the flavor is what my 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 shifu always says. Like yeah. you know, like of course you have to innovate. You know, like not like not innovate in the sense of like make up a new form or something, but it's a living art, right? Yeah. And, and I I think that you know, that, that's something that it took me a really long time to, I think, actually understand is, you know, when you are, quote unquote, using Bagua, it doesn't mean that you're executing like, you know, a Hotian palm, you know, according to the form perfectly in a fight or something like that. It's, I mean, sometimes, but, you know, like you know, when it comes down to it, a lot of those <clears throat> maneuvers are, um, you know, they're not like novel techniques per se, like they're, you know, they're like they're you know they're they're arm drags, they're trips, they're exactly. you know like I mean they're they're the same general techniques, but there's like we talked about there's that engine behind it, there's that quality of movement, there's that ability to um, like change one technique into another technique depending on the circumstance that you know has that particular quality of you know fluid change with that engine behind it that makes it bagua, and which you know in a certain interpretation means that you know at a certain point um you know theoretically when one's there it's like you're kind of always doing bagua regardless of what you're doing it's like exactly it's it's like that's the um you know like the 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 expression is just circumstantial but the actual like the essence of it and the flavor is a thing that you've developed into your like your literal bones like you it's it's part of your cellular matrix at that point <laughs> But it's also, you know, it's also very much dependent on your own uh, experience and situation. So, I mean, again, we can go back to the Xian Tian idea of, uh, of inheriting DNA from your parents. Your parents could both be five foot eight and skinny, and you're going to inherit their DNA, but you could come out six foot four and chunky. Um, you're not going to fit into the same clothes your parents wore. Mm -hmm. But you're carrying their DNA forward and you're going to make it work for you in your own particular circumstances. So mm -hmm. 
that's why it's so important. Like if you watch big people do Bagua and if you watch small people do Bagua, the underlying methods are all there. But they've then adapted it to their own particular circumstances. Like uh, absolutely, that, uh, we, yeah, we used to, we used to um, not joke about it exactly. But I mean, we, 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 I remember noticing um, my my Gongfu brother and I were noticing at a certain point, um, you know, that like you 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 don't you you see. I think you see this less now because I think there's just better available resources mm. than there used to be. Um, but you would see like you you could almost tell by a student, let's say you had like, you know, like a, you know, a somewhat, you know, like average build 20 something year old athletic student yeah. and they'll be doing their Bagua or the Shingi or whatever. And you could tell by how they were doing it, like the age and girth of their. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly <laughs> it's it. Like, it's like, like, you, you don't have, like the reason you're holding your arms like that is because your teacher, like that's actually where his waist is. <laughs> That's exactly it. And that's what I've noticed. And again, it's it's all about emulation instead of understanding for the most part with people. And they'll be like, no, his hand is here because it's supposed to be here. No, his hand's there because his stomach was in the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's why or, his hand or, is or, there. Or he was doing it at that speed because he was 80 when you were learning it. Yeah, but uh, I've, I've even met people that inherited um, postural problems from their teachers. Yeah. Like, like uh older teacher had a hip problem and then I see his young students moving like they have a hip problem and I'm like okay well I mean it's interesting <laughs> it's interesting that that happened but you know it's also kind of you're missing the point yeah yeah, yeah. so <laughs> it's interesting that that happened on two on two fronts <laughs> yeah yeah I mean at, at the end of the um at the end of the day you got to take the knowledge like I always try to think of martial arts as uh, is giving somebody a hammer, right? I think I've said this before in a podcast, and I can give you a hammer and teach you how to swing it, but you've got to make something for yourself. And some people will make a chair and some people will break a wall down. Same hammer, same swinging, but yep. they've applied it in the way that they want to use it in their life, right? So you could make a table, another person could make a chair, another one could uh, knock down a wall, another one could commit you know, a crime with it, you know? So there you go. The hammer is the same, which though. is a, a very apt description of uh, of Gong Fu, because I'm pretty sure yeah. people do all of those things with it. So. <laughs> what got you into the um, Chinese medicine side of things? Oh, that's a um, it's actually a, so it's a funny it's a funny question because I mean it's, in some ways it's actually what got me uh, in a, in a weird roundabout way into Bagua as well. Um, like I, so I mean my before I I did. Um, Bagua and, and Chinese martial arts in general. I, I, I did uh, like I, I was. It was one of those. Uh, I, I, I one of those guys from back in the day who you know back when I first started wanting to do martial arts, it was all karate. So um, I started with karate. So I don't really remember exactly when I became aware of Chinese medicine, but uh, I just you know it was something that for whatever reason it was like on my radar almost as far back as I can remember. Whether it was just from you know, some fleeting exposure to it just through being involved in, you know, in an East Asian martial art or, you know, from a scene in a, in a movie. I mean, I know in like some, there's a, at least one or two Jackie Chan movies where he's suddenly like running down the hallway full of acupuncture needles <laughs> and stuff, something like that. You know, well, so what movie was that? He was actually completely covered in needles. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, um, it wasn't, it wasn't Russia, was it, no, it wasn't Police Story. I don't know, it was always one of them though, and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looked like he a pin pushed. window with it too. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and uh, you know, knowing Jackie Chan, he was really he was really full of needles. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. anyways, um, you know, it was one of those things where I like I, again, I was I was aware of it. It wasn't like there was a one particular thing that suddenly like clued me into it. But um, like the 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 short version of the story was like I in, in university I, I studied anthropology and uh, and liberal arts, um, so I had this um, kind of weird mishmash background, which was more a result of not knowing what I wanted to do in university than anything else. But um, it what I ended up focusing on in my anthropology part of my program was traditional medicine, and. Um, did my senior project on on um, on like on traditional medicine uh, integrating into North American medical systems, basically. Um, and on top like of that, uh, like um, 
Native American medical system? Um, for for me, I, I actually I, I actually focused on Polynesian medicine because I went uh, on a, I went on a field school to Polynesia when I was in university. So, um, so but so yeah, essentially. But it was just it was more of the the bent of taking a traditional medical model and trying to um, make sense of it in the modern medical model. And the the whole kind of thesis was that the nature of the medicine actually completely changes form as it as it fits into a different uh like medical mythology <laughs> mm -hmm. um <clears throat> one of the uh one of the examples that i used for this was uh kava which was i mean i think it's now fairly i don't know if ever, anyone remembers what, what kava is now but it was at the time it was a bit of a, a hot topic in the in the medicinal world because it was like it's an intoxicant it was still you know like it was legal but you know it was there there was a talk of it being controlled and i mean it's basically like uh it's makes you very very like sleepy and euphoric oh, okay. and it was getting marketed in um you know western holistic medicine as an anti-anxiety medicine okay. and i one of the one of the examples that i used was i i i, I compared uh, origin myths of the kava plant from various Polynesian cultures to the, you know, the, you know, what what you might call the origin myth of kava in North American wellness industry. Uh, and so one of the, 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 the origin myth from uh, Vanuatu in, uh, I think it's in like, you know, Melanesia or my, yeah. Um, yeah and uh, the, the, sto the, the story of how kava came into being was essentially there was this, uh, uh, traveling king on the island who stops at this very small little hamlet for for a night and the family there's this uh husband and wife and their daughter and they you know and they're like you know deeply honored that they're you know that the king has stopped there for the night but are also deeply uh anxious because they have nothing to offer him for you know by, by way of meal so what they end up doing is killing their daughter and serving their daughter to the king oh, and and um, you know, and, and where they bury the daughter, the kava plant grows out of this grave. Mm -hmm. And so the implication of the myth is, you know, one of the things that you see used, um, you know, associated with 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 kava usage in traditional Polynesian culture is um, it's a very social thing. Like it's often this is used in like these uh, very in a, in, a, in a big like social, uh, um, you know, like like, a, like like we would use alcohol in a sense, I guess, like a right, social right. lubricant. But there's also a really, really deep, um, what's the word, like association of communication with 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 ancestors. So oh, you know, essentially, like like communications with the you know with with the dead and the other side. And it's kind of give, and it sort of has this inherent dual nature. Where on one hand, it's this like euphoric, you know you know, social lubricant, but also it's like a gateway into the underworld in a sense too. And so this myth kind of like imp implies that, right? It's like, you know, there's this, th there's a simultaneous, um, uh, what's the word, like hospitality being offered at the same time as the loss of a loved one. And then the kava plant is sort of the thing that literally is the bridge of those two. Those two yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, in my somewhat, uh, um, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure what the word is for, but in in in, in my, my my paper, I kind of said, you know, like, imagine if we tried to market kava in the in the, in the health and wellness world using that as the origin myth, and <laughs> who, oh, who's going to want to take that for the, for their for their anxiety, right? Yeah. Um. And so what what you see instead was, you know, I I, I use like advertisements for kava, and and then and they were describing where it comes from, and every single one of them would say something like, imagine you're on the white sandy beaches palm you know palm trees rustling in the breeze the sound of the pacific ocean lapping at the waves you're swinging in a hat you know so this like complete idealization of polynesia which of course you know if it's like it's a very very thin understanding of what the polynesian you know culture and world is it's just, you know, essentially looking at it like this you know, nothing more than a vacation destination is yeah. very, uh, very, very North American <laughs> to do yeah, this, yeah, right? Yeah. And yet, that is the 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 backstory that's given to the same plant. And so, the the whole idea was that you know, when this 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 plant, like this thing that doesn't actually change, gets literally transplanted from one culture to the other, the whole mythology around it changes, and 
that either informs how it's used, what it's used for, and why. And that, you know, effectively is like becomes as much a part of the medicinal effect as the actual chemical components of it. Totally. So anyways, there's there's that. <laughs> that's pretty uh, interesting. I think, sorry? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you asked why I got into Chinese medicine. So I, I was um uh, I so I was doing that in university and you know, like I think I mentioned the other part of my degree was liberal studies, which was basically uh, like a discussion based seminar program where we studied the Western canon of classics. So, um, you know, I, so I had this kind of dual or I guess, you know, like I had an interest in holistic medicine um, and, and, you know, traditional medicine. I was kind of getting like trained and, you know, developing a a a, a, a like of reading old books. <laughs> And I also was a martial artist. Like I'd also been doing martial arts since I was a teenager. And and then and as it happens, I randomly met a guy at a music festival of all places um, on one of the small golf islands around here. And he was practicing Xing Yi <laughs> of all things. Oh, very interesting. And I was like, hey, my people. Um, he was doing that at the music festival? Yes, he was. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Vancouver Island's a weird place. What 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 band was playing while he was doing P Tran? Oh, I I <laughs> couldn't tell you. I don't I don't know if I was paying attention to what bands were playing at that point. Okay. Um, it was, there was like four stages. I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But there, but there was a guy doing you know doing Xing Yi, um, and uh, I, so we ended up like chatting and because um, you know I was like hey you're doing martial arts and we started you know nerding out about martial arts. And then he mentions, oh, yeah, no, I'm studying uh, Chinese medicine at the college um, in, in Nelson, which is, um, I don't know if you know where Nelson, B.C. is. It's this very small town in the mountains in the interior of uh, British Columbia. Um, very small town. But there is a, uh, you know, surprise, maybe surprisingly, there is a very highly regarded Chinese medicine school nestled in that town. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, like one of the more like, you know, long, longer running and uh, consistently well regarded Chinese medicine schools in the in the country is like nestled in this tiny little t town in the Kootenays. Oh, very um, interesting. Yeah, BC is a weird place in that in that regard. Like we actually have a lot of Chinese medicine uh, education institutions ar around here. Most of them are on the coast and in Vancouver and the right. island, but there's one in, in the interior. Uh, but anyways, he mentioned this and I there was like this light bulb moment for me because I suddenly th had the thought of a one can do this as a as a thing like <laughs> this is something that i can actually look at as a viable career path yeah. and on top of that in british columbia really uh, so it was this moment where suddenly like you know this handful of interests kind of came together in this really cohesive thought well some and, people would know, call that destiny but anyway. some people might might yeah um never saw the guy again I actually like i ended up uh, some of my classmates when i did start studying actually knew him because they had transferred from the school in nelson they're like oh yeah yeah i remember that guy um but i you know i never i never never saw that guy again but um you know long story short is after that i kind of just couldn't drop the idea and um, after I finished my my degree at university, I had another year left in, at, uh, at at uni, and so I spent that last year actually starting to study Mandarin and preparation for going to Chinese medicine school. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, that's a good thing to learn for sure. Yeah, well, that's, that's what everyone was telling me. I, I, I went and talked to a bunch of acupuncturists and Chinese medicine practitioners. Um, I went to talk to uh, people at the various colleges in Vancouver as well as um, down in Victoria, and literally every single one of them. Actually, you know what's funny? Every single one of them said that learning Chinese was a good idea and that going to China was a good idea. All but one all made it sound like before I even bothered getting started, I should go and live in China for a year and study Mandarin. And, mm. you know, and it's funny because that probably wouldn't have been a bad idea, but, you know, I, I didn't want to. I wanted to start studying. Like I wanted to, I wanted to like get on with, you know, I just finished one degree. I didn't want to spend too much time before starting the next one. Right. Um, and not everyone they, has the ability to do that, though. So I mean, it's yeah, kind of tall order. Exactly, and so but it was it was presented to me in this in this way of like, oh well, you gotta you gotta learn how to speak Mandarin first. You gotta go live in China for like you know at least a you know a year if not ten. Um, and but then I I ended up going to a school in Vancouver, and there's a very well uh, well respected doctor there named Henry Liu, um, and and I'd heard about him like the uh, I'd been getting some treatments done and was picking the brain of a, a Chinese medicine doctor in my hometown who was a student of Dr. Liu's. So I was like, you know, I was told, oh, you should go talk to him. And 
you know, and he had that, he, he was one of those guys who has that kind of, um, uh, you know, that like the old time authority, that relaxed, nonchalant authority of someone who just knows what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I remember like I was saying, yeah, everyone keeps telling me I should go to China and learn that matter. And he, he literally cuts me off going, no, 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 no. Once you start studying Chinese medicine, you're always going to be studying Chinese medicine. You got lots of time to do all that other stuff. Yeah, that's true. And so I, you know, I, and that it was, it was quite relieving to me because I wanted to just get started. And so, you know, basically I, 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 you know, I studied Mandarin University to get a, like, get a bit of a leg up on it. And then, uh, um, moved down to Victoria to, to attend school, um, you know, within about a year of that. And, um, like, like I was saying, like that was actually because of that was why I ended up meeting Yusin because Yusin was in Victoria. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's kind of everything kind of converged there, but you did say yeah. you did some Xingyi before you, you started training with Yusin. Where were you doing that? So I, I started, I, I was, um, that was up in Nanaimo still. And I don't know if you know where Nanaimo is. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> do, do you do you you know so you know where Vancouver is? I'm I'm assuming. Yeah. You know where Vancouver Island is? Yeah. So um, Victoria is the capital of Brit British Columbia, which is on the very southern tip of Vancouver Island. Okay. Um, Nanaimo is one of the the you know larger towns supposedly in on the island. It's like, but it's still a pretty small town. But it's uh, further up the coast. It's but kind of in like the you know, lower third of Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island's mostly just like mountains and wilderness. Okay. But all along the coast, Bigfoot, there's a couple of highways and Bigfoot, some towns. Bigfoot's Sorry? There. I've heard Bigfoot's there too. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> At least we got some. We got some. We got some bears that look like Bigfoot. <laughs> um, actually, it's pretty funny on uh, uh, Netflix recently. There's been some like various documentaries that are like about or at least based in Vancouver Island, and it's weird to because it's typically been a pretty out of the way place that you know most people don't know about. But there's a full like series on on the island, and then weirdly, this is a total random aside, but. Uh, there was a documentary about Pamela Anderson that recently came out. Okay. <laughs> um, and she's from Vancouver Island. She's from Ladysmith. So oh, okay. the whole documentary is like basically filmed, you know, 20 minutes from where I grew up. Oh, very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just kind of funny. I'm like, I know that place. Well, of course I know that place. It's Ladysmith. Just coming back to my question, it's uh, time for a cheesy joke. But when I asked you which band was playing while he was doing Petra, and the correct answer is Metallica. Ah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I missed that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, P trend metal. So there you go. Okay, I am I'll for next time. So I'm sorry, to make sorry Byron. Jokes. And, and, uh, we, we can we can edit that back if you want to ask a joke again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you finished um, you finished your your studies of Chinese medicine. You actually you have a practice now too, right? Actually, I I I have a practice. I actually have been teaching at the college for about seven years now as well. Um, so I, uh, I'm pretty immersed in, in that world these days. That's very cool. Yeah. So it's have the, you ever thought about there's like a that. city for that because like we do have a few Chinese medicine. We have a, well now there's only two, but there's, it's a town that's become sort of a hub of people coming to learn Chinese medicine. Um, so as far as like kind of building a really, you know, like just diverse career in, for, in terms of like, you know, acupuncture and Chinese medicine, it's been a, a really good place to be for that because I have a, I have a practice, which is great, but also I get to be like a, you know, kind of like 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 a like like a teacher, which allows me to also be a little scholarly about it at the same time, and really have a whole variety of different ways of interacting with the with the material, That's which is cool. which is awesome. You know, which is just really really is it's, it's a very big privilege to be able to do that. Have you ever? I mean, have you ever thought of we're coming back to what you were saying that? as you learn more about certain aspects of Western medicine and then they talk about X, Y, and Z, you say, but hang on, I've seen something like this in Bagua. Have you ever thought about compiling that into some sort of a book or something with your, your own little discoveries? <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And uh, I've had uh, a lot of, of quite a number of people ask me to, to start penning something for a few years now. Um, yeah, actually it's, uh, it's, I, it's funny you ask this because I, I literally taught a seminar on this like last weekend. Is why oh, I could. It's, it's, it's why why we couldn't do this on the weekend. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> um, my um, like I said, my 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 biggest 
Oh, where do you even start with this? So I, my, the, my practice has primarily been focused on like injuries and pain. Um, just, you know, being a martial artist, that's sort of the thing that really um, was got me, you know, into the medicine. And that was sort of what I tended to use it for most primarily when I was, you know, when I was first encountering it. So as, as it happens with those things, you know, the thing you have the most more personal connection to with it are the things you tend to spend more time reading about and studying. Um, and so I was, you know, had a particular mind for treating injuries and pain, which, you know, in the field of, you know, modern acupuncture and Chinese medicine, we call that orthopedic acupuncture or sports acupuncture. Right. And like I said, when I moved down to Victoria to study Chinese medicine, I basically met uh, Yang Lasher in about a month from the time that I moved down. So I, I basically started studying acupuncture and Chinese medicine within the same like four week period as starting to study Bagua. Very cool. Um, which was huge. And I, 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 I really can't stress enough that, you know, um, my, my primary teacher for both of them has actually probably been Yang, Yang Shifu. <laughs> oh, that's um, interesting. Des despite him claiming to not know much about Chinese medicine, um, the majority of the big aha moments that I had in, in acupuncture and Chinese medicine were because of his understanding of Bagua. So it's been, uh, it, it, it was a very serendipitous and very, uh, um, like, major part of, you know, how I've kind of constructed my understanding of things. Yeah. But um, one of the reasons for this is, like, you know, one of the things that we emphasize so heavily in Gao is the sinews. And, I mean, you asked earlier about some of the differences between Yizong and Zhizong, and then we kind of got sidetracked before I had a, if I, I think if I started, I kind of sidetracked myself before I fully answered that question, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> but uh, th that's one of the things that I tend to notice the the most between the way we do our Bagua and, you know, like a lot of styles is that we, we have this very big emphasis on like really, really stretching the tendons and like really like almost emphasizing some of the um, like, you know, uh, like, the, like going to the end of the movements. And that's like, you know, it's, it's not like that's not happening in other systems, of course, but there's just this seems to be this like particular emphasis on this in the way that, you know, I, I was taught and the way that, you know, Houston was taught as well uh, by, by, by all accounts. And, but there was like, this emphasis on, you know, like the, the, the thing is tuning up the sinews. It's all about the sinews, the sinews, the sinews, the sinews. Right. You know, and we, we learn about like the four ends, you know, there's the, the flesh end, which is the tongue on the roof of the mouth. There's the bone end, the keep the teeth together. Um, there's the blood end, which is the hair. And there's the sinews, the fingernails, but that, and you know, Yusuf is always big on like, other ones are important, but I cannot stress the sinews enough. And so that was on my mind. And I, you know, I was in school learning about anatomy and acupuncture channels and injuries and stuff. And then I was, you know, on the weekends going and having Yusuf basically like tell me that I wasn't torquing my body enough or twisting my sinews enough and, yeah. and emphasizing this. Um, and then, you know, physically putting me in positions that I didn't think I was capable of. <laughs> <laughs> and then he laughs and walks away. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, at, at some point encountered uh, this, you know, like this, this, concept of, of of fascia right like this in in, in anatomy which is you know I, I at first i was kind of aware of this as you know oh it's like the saran wrap of muscles or something like that but you know long long story short um became much more aware of like the ubiquitous nature of this 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 tissue like all like literally th through every little space in the body and kind of went, oh, like, so when we're, I, I, in my mind at that point, when I was thinking, oh, the sinews, I was thinking, you know, oh, like, it's like ligaments and tendons, you know, where there, there's bones are. But I, in my mind, I still had this this concept of, like, a distinction between, like, muscle tissue and tendon and, um, you know, like, skin and, and, and bone and things like that. But, you know, then researching this, you know, this connective, like, this connective tissue science and research, you realize that, well, no, like that connective tissue is as pervasive as the vascular system or as pervasive right. as the nervous system. Like there's literally not a cell in the body that's not touched by it. And it responds to, to specifically kinetic information. So tension, pressure, torque, um, and it, and it models itself after, the imprint of tension that runs through the fiber direction like the fibers will literally develop 
in accordance with how tension is translated through that oh, okay. that, that, that tissue. Yeah. So all of a sudden, this you know uh, this light bulb went off. Light bulb of, moment. That's why you know what that that's what it's you know, that's what Bob Kwa is talking about. But that's what that's what Yusin's talking about. He says the sinews. It's not just the tendons. It's literally this tissue that's everywhere in the body that you are engaging when you're doing these like you know full multi you know like three dimensional maneuvers with the body in it but in a very unified way and this is why of course it takes so long to develop because you don't just learn the movement you have to literally remodel your connective tissue mm. it's and, quite interesting that you say that because i mean some people wouldn't understand they think oh my you know how can you if it's in your arm you're stretching you're stretching your arm what does the rest of your body have to do with it you know like yeah. okay but i mean they could try this out themselves by like Extending your arm out to the side, twisting twisting your wrist, pressing your arm back, feel that tension, and now simply tilt your head to one side. Yeah. And you'll see that suddenly the tension becomes a lot tighter. And you're thinking, yeah. hang on, but that's my neck and my head, and that's my hand and my arm. Why why is this working? Well, there's some stuff that's connected between the two. Absolutely. You know, so. And then and then and then you know, like tuck your hips in a little bit and drop your weight and all of a sudden you're bringing it down to your feet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And yeah, it's, I mean, like, 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 like I said, it was one of those things where, you know, having this fairly profound light bulb moment go off about, you know, just connective tissue in general, and then looking back at Bagua and going, holy crap, not only do, are they aware of this, they have a sophisticated system of doing it. Yeah. And, um, and well, yeah. And then, you know, on the Chinese medicine side of it, um, some of the really interesting research that uh, has um, been you know, on on my mind in the last little while. There's actually there was a, a, a physician in Beijing named Wang Juyi who passed away a few years ago, um, who really revitalized uh, a classical method of like channel palpation diagnosis okay. in acupuncture. Um, and so you know, it just sounds kind of funny because like uh, you know in a you know, in like in ac in Chinese medicine and in acupuncture, of course, there's like, you know, there's these fairly large components of it. You know, there's herbal medicine and formulas. There's organ theory. There's um, then there's acupuncture and then and, and the channel system. And then you know, there's diagnostic methods that kind of go along with all of them. And and you know, more more recently in the more like modern renderings of Chinese medicine, uh, what's being emphasized is like pulse diagnosis and tongue diagnosis and yeah. and asking questions about the organ systems and almost a complete ignoring of like actually touching your patient's body and, and feeling uh, what's going on like in between the spaces of everything and Wang Ji kind of thought well hold on a second they talk about this quite a lot in the classics like maybe I should start doing this and mm. um, and you know I, I, I can't speak to his you know his story very well because I only kind of know it via some of his his students, but ended up um, you know really reviving this practice of actually like you know using like like you know like like a like manual palpation to yeah. explore the spaces in between muscle systems and everything to glean diagnostic information, and ended up forming a theory. So I mean. It, I don't know I, I, um, how familiar um, you are with like Chinese medicine physiology and everything, but you have Basically. a concept of something called like the San Jiao, um, yeah. like, like the three the three burners or the three the triple energizer or something, right. which is this organ in Chinese medicine, right? And uh, and it, you know it, even in the the classics, I think, they, I think the English translation in general is triple warmer. Yeah, triple warmer, triple energizer, the three burners. Like you see it, 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 it there, there's like an alchemical allusion there to it, almost being like a you know, like a like a three tiered, um, like you know, chemistry <laughs> set kind of thing, yeah. right? Um, and it's typically you know thought to refer to like the three major cavities of the body, like you know the upper thoracic cavity, the epigastric abdominal cavity, and then like the lower lumbo or like uh, like abdominal pelvic cavity. Mm -hmm. And there are very real like um, like membranes separating those those two region those three regions in the body, um, but. Uh, Wang Ji ended up developing this theory that you know the when it, when you look at what's described as the the function of this this you know so-called organ in in the classics it's, it's often referred to as an irrigation system and so he kind of devised this uh this this thought of like well 
you know, actually what it's probably referring to is not the three major large cavities in the body, but rather like all of the extracellular space in the body in general. Um, as you know, in, in between all the actual cell structures, there is, of course, like, you know, there's space, but that space is filled with, you know, none other than this collagen matrix that essentially shuttles fluids between different cellular structures. And, you know, so again, light bulb moment here, all of a sudden, like, here's this tissue that, you know, is becoming this sort of new thing in modern medicine. And not only is this addressed in a very sophisticated training way in Bagua, it seems to also have this very sophisticated understanding in classical Chinese medicine. <laughs> and, you know, and, and you know, one, once again, we kind of have this, you know, this funny moment where we, we, we look deeply into modern research and end up finding something that has been very old. Very, very old, right? And, and you know, and understood better than we do now. And we're just trying to keep up. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, as I was, I guess you asked a question about like, as you know, kind of penning a book on this or something like that. And, and then may, may, maybe in another 20 years or something. Oh, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> but, whenever you're ready, I think it would yeah. be interesting. When, well, well yeah, well, sorry, like, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask you what it was like, what young young you son is like as a teacher, and what it was like uh, training with him. Um, wonderful. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say wonderful. He's a wonderful person, and I love him dearly, and I have always enjoyed training with him. <laughs> um, he's a yeah, he's a very friendly guy. He is really funny. He's he is a total perfectionist when it comes to Bagua and training directly with them. you never feel like you're doing anything right. <laughs> oh, that's how it but, should be though. Sorry? That's how oh, it should be. Oh, of course, be. yeah. But yeah, but you know, but like you don't, he, but he, he does it in a way that, you know, it's, you, you don't necessarily walk away feeling like, you know, I'm never going to get this. He just kind of, you know, he, he's, he's a really um, approachable teacher in that way, uh, which, which is nice. Um, no, I mean, I, I've uh, like, I have really, uh, been I, I've, I've really lucked out. You know, I've, I've really lucked out in general in martial arts. I've, I've never really had like a a group that was really toxic or anything. But um, yeah, you know, I, I kind of just have fallen into some pretty pretty decent groups. Um, but I, I really really lucked out um, managing to catch Yusin when uh, when he was actually like up up for taking students on still. Oh, is he not doing that anymore? I mean, he is kind of like you know, it's he's been doing. I mean, I think it, it, it is still going on, but, um, you know, this is, I guess, another big part of the whole story is um, he, like, when he immigrated to when, when, to, to Canada, he, um, you know, he, like, he, that was, he was probably, in, I think he's in his late 20s, him and his wife came over, um, and uh, he's started, like, you know, running a coffee shop in West Edmonton Mall, uh, and, uh, you know, a little while later, um B. Tianzhuo came over and basically said, you know, you need to start teaching Bagua because this is a pretty small lineage. And if you don't start doing this, like we're, we're not going to have a lot of people to, to carry it forward. Right. And so um, you can still find this actually, if you, if you look in the right place on the internet, um, he, Yusin basically said, okay, well, there's this, let's, let's, let's check the internet to see if anyone is up for, you know, like creating like an online learning community with this Bagua. So it was on, um, remember the old forum Shenwu? Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's Tim Cocknell's old, yes. old thing. Yeah. yeah. So you know, out of nowhere, Yusin make po makes this post on Shenwu about, hey, I'm going to start teaching this style of Bagua from Wu Mengxia, the Jizong lineage, and mm -hmm. you know, and it, it from from what I gather, like it kind of like you know turned the heads of a bunch of people, being like, wait, what lineage? <laughs> Who? <Yeah. laughs> and you know, and then you know, got he got like I, I hadn't I hadn't met Yusin at this point yet. Um, so I kind of pieced this together from, you know, some, some stories of the people who were involved, but, you know, all of a sudden, like, you know, there was a, a handful of people who had been involved in Bagua or, you know, there were students of like Tim or Mark, uh, Tim Cartmels or Marcus Brinkman's or, um, you know, it, it had kind of been involved with like the Yizong lineage and they suddenly like, you know, started asking, you know, Yusin for some more information and he started providing more information and everyone kind of, you know, recognized what this guy had <laughs> and just by, like, by the way he was talking about it. And so relatively quickly, uh, do you remember the old Empty Flower Forum? Yes. Yeah. So um, there was a uh, an online study program that was launched in a, in a private uh, forum, like a private sub forum off of the Empty Flower site. Okay. And the idea uh, was that, 
you know, people would sign up in these in this cohort format, and once every two weeks, uh, Yusin would release a um, a lesson video. Okay. Up to this like uh, this like you know, separate website that then you know, it was like obviously like you know like a locked you know password protected thing, and people would watch the video and then submit homework to him, and he would critique it and stuff. Okay. And so. Like so, so he was he was doing that. Um, I want to say that was probably about two thousand and seven, um, and and so when when I when I met him, actually, it's really funny because you you know Andrea Falk, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, because that, that's uh, she's how you met D. Lausher, correct? Yeah, it was. Yeah, that he get, I got his contact details. Yeah. yeah, I know. It, it, I remember you saying that when I when I was in Beijing, and it's funny because she's from Victoria. Oh uh, uh, yeah. And um, I don't think she's in, around here right now. Hmm. But when I when I moved down to Victoria, like I said, I'd been doing Xingyi up in Nanaimo, um, actually through a James McNeil lineage. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, yeah, it was, I was a student of James McNeil's that lives in Nanaimo and was doing some I was doing some Xingyi with him, which which was great. I I really enjoyed it, and it was definitely uh, um, it was different from the karate that I'd been doing. Like I'd been doing Okinawan karate at that point for a few years. Okay. Um, yeah, about seven years at that point, and so. Like that was my first exposure to Chinese martial arts was through the James McNeil line of Xingyi. Okay. And then I and I was enjoying it so when I moved down to Victoria and um was you know new in the city and I was kind of sussing out the martial arts scene and uh nothing was like, you know, there was the kids taekwondo classes up the road and <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff that is obviously, you know, street facing and you know, and very easy to find, but I wanted to find something kind of like Xingyi. So I I made a post on some Xingyi Facebook group about like, oh, is there anyone doing Xingyi in the area? And um, of all people, Andrea Falk said, oh, I'm in, I'm not in Victoria right now, but I, I'm in Montreal, but I might be back in the, in the future. Um, and someone who I don't even know who they were, and I still have no idea exactly, you know, I, I, I don't I have no idea who this was. It wasn't somebody who was involved with, with the group, from what I gather. But someone said, hey, if you're anywhere in Victoria, you should really check out this guy named Yang Yusin. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, he's like, and it was funny because before I had moved down to Victoria, one of, of the, the guy I was learning Xingyi from in Nanaimo was a guy named Landon Mose. And he had a student named um, named Dave, who um, I don't know his last name, but he was like, he'd, he'd I, I never, I had not met him, but he had like, you know, a year or so earlier moved down to Victoria. So when Landon found out that I was going down to Victoria, he was like, oh, you should, you should, uh, you should connect with Dave, my former student. You guys should do some training together. Um, he's doing this weird style of Bagua. I'm not so sure about it. <laughs> ah, okay. Those are the words, <laughs> and I remember. And, and, and I remember, like, yeah, it's this weird style of Bagua. They do this weird stepping method. I really, I, I'm really not too sure about it. I'm like, oh, all right, <laughs> cool. Um, and so I, you know, when I, I had heard like, oh yeah, this guy's doing, this guy's this guy teaching this Bagua, and it's 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 pretty it's pretty interesting. It's pretty legit, mm -hmm. and it's funny because you know I actually didn't want to learn Bagua. I actually yeah. like I had you know at that point. My experience of Bagua was, you know, very, very superficial, um, more like almost as like a kind of accessory form of like almost like mobility training or just like something fun to do as a cool down exercise or what I had found on the Internet, which was often like, you know, very performancey wushu kind of yeah. you know, Bagua, right? And, and, you know, and I'd come from like an Okinawan karate background and a Shingi background, so I wanted to like... You know, do something that was obviously like very linear and you know, martial, <laughs> martial, very right? obviously martial, yeah. very obviously martial. Yeah. Um, so I I ended up um, you know that after you know a couple people had mentioned you know like this you know the guy in Victoria doing Bagua the guy said like oh so go down to the empty flower forum and uh, and find the guy with the username Yusin and send him a message and so I thought okay well cool that's that's you know good good lead so i so i did that um and uh you know i sent him a very formal uh a very formal message right like you know young young lusher my name is rory nat fisher um here's my martial arts resume <laughs> okay. uh, are you, you know, like this is you know, this is my background are you accepting students if you are you know would you consider you know, would you consider letting me come and join the group and etc cetera, etc cetera. and i got a message back that in effect said oh hey rory dave said you might be joining us <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was, uh, I was like, oh, all right. You were kind of, um, you already knew that was coming, right? So, and so I, at that point, what was going on was, you know, they, they were they were meeting up. It was just um, Yusin and this guy, Dave, at the time. And they were meeting up every um, two weeks to like train, but also film these lesson videos that were going out wow. to this online group. Okay. So the training was really structured around like that schedule. And so at the, you know, you know, for the, so for the, I mean, then, you know, time, time kind of went on and, you know, Dave ended up, um, he kind of, I don't know, he sort of fell off the radar actually, but don't really know, like he, he, stopped, he stopped coming in and we didn't see him, we didn't hear any activity about him from him on the forum, but a few other people joined over the, over the years and stuff. But I, I remember there was this point where, um, you know, like you had kind of had, uh, a handful of like online students like we'd, we'd run several cohorts for a while um i think there i think there ended up being like officially like six or seven on the old forum and the the the, the online course is still going on through like a different site but it's very like it's very small time and you kind of have to like you know talk to one of the one of the more um senior people from that group to kind of like get access to the old lesson videos and stuff and um uh use and still involved with and still doing it but it's a, it's definitely much less like pushed out there as it used to be um yeah so it, it, but it's funny because like i i feel like when i like i said i was very privileged to kind of meet him when he was like right at the beginning of this project and like kind of i wouldn't necessarily say eagerly accepting students but was like happy to have someone come and join in mm. and you know and at a certain point it was like there was it 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 became obvious that you know there 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 wasn't a, there wasn't necessarily like a lot of a uh, um like uh, you, you would have had to really really like work to to stick around and 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 uh and 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 continue on training okay. in in person and you know and, and like and not and not not because you know there was any like you know like dismissiveness or anything but it's it, we we like you know in the the in town group like the actual like local training group it was very casual very you know a lot like you know when um i met up with you in beijing and we were just kind of right. you know, with with deal sure it's like you sort of meet up and you all kind of go and do and work on your own thing and um you sort of wander around and kind of help out you know from time to time and then you, you know kind of gather around and learn learn something new or discuss something but if you know we had a handful of people come by over the years who obviously wanted to like you know come and learn a form or something and yeah. sort of just you know, like kind of like, you know, we're, we're shown like a basic Zhang posture and then kind of, you know, practice it for a minute and then stopped and kind of stood around waiting for the next thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and and so I, I think at a certain point, like, you know, Yusin was like, I've got like, you know, a couple of like solid local students who are like, you know, like they're, they're showing up regularly, which is, mm -hmm. which is great. I've got a handful of distant students who come by, you know, every few months. And um, so at a certain point, anyone who wanted to learn locally, he kind of just like, directed you know one of us towards them or right 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 something like that um and yeah like so like i you know i almost felt like i feel like i kind of rolled in under the gate as it was closing and uh happened to you know just be be, be very very lucky in that regard yeah yeah and and uh what is what is uh i mean when he immigrated to the usa what was it for a specific type of work sorry to canada was it for a specific type of work or what what does he actually do as a background? I mean, you said he opened a coffee shop. Uh, okay, so he he's actually an engineer by by training. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, he he's an engineer. I, I believe a polymer engineer, um, oh, and wow. his his wife is a neurologist. And they actually, when they immigrated to Canada, I think it was actually just to just to come to Canada. Like it was um uh, it was just to to leave China and come to Canada and. I see. They, you know, that there an opportunity came up for them to, for them to go, and I remember asking him about it a few times, and he was just saying, "Oh, Canada was always one of those places that I just like, I just, I, I, I really like the sound of, like, I really like, I always had this, like, you know, sort of idea of of moving to Canada," um, and they were, no, they were both, you know, from what I gather, like, very busy, successful professionals in Beijing, um, and but this opportunity came up, and they, they, they took it, and so they, okay. they, they moved to Canada, and. Uh, landed in Montreal originally, I believe, and from there moved to Edmonton and um, yeah, set up a coffee shop. And you know, their their daughter was born basically within a few months of them arriving okay. in Canada. I, I from from what I gather, um, uh, his wife, you know, my my, my Shumu, she would have been pregnant when they landed in Montreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then you know, so they started raising a family in Edmonton and. 
probably because of the weather, uh, came out to the island. <laughs> yeah, I've heard Edmonton's pretty cold. Yeah, I mean, Edmonton's pretty cold, um, and I'm not sure yeah, what you've heard about the island, but I mean, w w this is often referred to as the Hawaii of Canada. Um, ah, okay. Like, for, for instance, right now, you know, while there's like, you know, they're looking at like, you know, 20 degrees, 30 degrees below zero, kind of in the prairies and, and, and onwards, we're like, you know, there's there's cherry blossoms beginning to bloom here right now. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so, so it's, it's so. More, more mild weather-wise. Much more, much rainier. It's a very rainy climate out here, but you know we have like it's a it's it's a very it's like like a coastal rainforest environment, so it's very mild and very wet. But we our 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 actual like cold winter lasts about two weeks, and then we're you know we're usually above zero, and like literally like literally cherry blossoms start blooming around right now, and we oh, very cool. are into spring pretty early. So do you get as much probably, do you get as much rain as like Seattle. Uh, a little, I mean, in sense, yeah, but Victoria's tucked into a little bit of a shadow, so we don't, we actually, Victoria specifically gets, like, notoriously less of everything than the surrounding area, so Seattle gets tons of rain, Vancouver gets tons of rain, um, you go out to the west coast of Vancouver Island, and it's, and it's like Seattle and Vancouver combined, oh. um, but, you know, because we're in this little, like, um, like this, this, this kind of, uh, like the, the the Olympic Peninsula on the west coast of Washington kind of juts out and creates this little um, like alcove of the Strait, like the, the Juan de Fuca Strait, which kind of tucks us away from um, all of like the major weather systems. So they kind of disperse when they get here. So we have this like infamously mild climate in Victoria. So we get rain, but you know when it rains in Seattle, like and it's just torrential, we get like a little bit of a shower up up in Victoria. Okay. Yeah. Ev everyone else kind of like takes it first and then we get the leftovers <laughs> well that's nice i mean that's a nice environment all right so um you you mentioned that uh, you kind of got you slid in while the gate was closing um is young Yusin still teaching groups or is he only teaching his older students now he's basically just teaching his older students now okay. um, again like, like the online course is still running to some degree but um you know i mean but i i what it seems to be more now nowadays is some of the more senior students who are still active with that uh, will every now and then kind of like bring on, you know, one of like their friends or, you know, like one of their students to kind of like just get that more like direct contact with, with young Yusin. Um, uh -huh. And, uh, and you know, but, you know, but he's like, he's kind of semi-retired now. Like he, he ran a coffee shop in Victoria here for, oh, like many years. And right. back in 2018 sold it and, uh, he he also runs an ice cream cart down on the waterfront in Victoria. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, in the summertime, it's ice cream season, and so him and his wife are are just like like running around like we, we were crazy busy because Victoria is a very big tourist city. Okay. So, um, so they're they're putting their ice cream cart down on the waterfront every every uh, every day. You know, usually from kind of mid May or so till early September. Um. But he's been traveling a lot lately. Like he really has just been kind of using his you know, his daughter's off at university now. Um, they sold their coffee shop, and he's basically like you know enjoying his, oh, his nice. like his, his time. No, it's, it's 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 beautiful to see. It's like I, um, you know, he's I, I I've, I've not known anyone who to work as hard and as consistently as someone like he has. It's just like it right, was right. really great to see when he actually was able to actually get some spare time. You know, like we we used to train in the coffee shop on Sundays um, because that was like where we had some space consistently. Yeah. But because we, you know, the coffee shop was officially closed on Sundays, but we would, uh, uh, you know, me and like the one other local student here, we would just show up there at eight o'clock on Sunday mornings and we'd push all the tables aside and literally do bagua in a coffee shop <laughs> on Sunday mornings. But then people started wandering in <laughs> because there's people in the coffee shop. Of course. And, and so it was this really funny, funny scene. And like this would this went on for, I want to say like seven or eight years, of um, you know we used to train in a schoolyard that was out closer to his house. But then for whatever reason we started doing it at the coffee shop because we could then do it. It was just I think it was just easier for everyone that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, like the the weekly routine was like we would meet up, have breakfast in the coffee shop, push all the tables aside, start doing our circle walking in the coffee shop. 
And then inevitably, um, you know, random people would come in. There was even, we even got Sunday morning regulars who would come in at about the same time. And then me and Lee, my, my, my you know, the Gong Fu brother of mine who's local here, we would then kind of, you know, try to sit unassumingly, you know, wiping the sweat from our brows in a coffee shop <laughs> and act like nothing was going on while, you know, while our teacher goes and makes a sandwich for somebody. <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, like when I'm training, if it's bad weather and I'm training somewhere that's like kind of in a public space, uh, maybe even inside a building or something, and then uh, you're sweating and, and, and then somebody comes like they're just you know, living, going through the area as it's yeah, intended yeah. to be. And you're like pretending like you're looking out the window, but you're completely drenched in sweat and they're <laughs> totally. looking at you like you're a lunatic. And you're like, let's move along already. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, you know, it was really funny because, like I said, there was like a, a few people who became like the Sunday locals and, and we would just like not stop training when they came in. And it was uh, like part of their Sunday morning routine is to like come in, have a quick coffee and like a muffin and, you know, while these two guys were doing some weird Chinese martial art in the corner of the coffee shop while, you know, the owner of Ed, who there is their, te is their teacher, is like chatting to him, talking about the news. <laughs> yeah. just, it, was a, it was a very funny scene. And if, every now and then if the coffee shop got busy enough, he would boot us back to the kitchen and we would have to do like, which is a very narrow space. And so we were literally doing... Um, like we couldn't do Bagua in the kitchen because it was too narrow, but we could do Tantwe. So we would do Tantwe in the kitchen Okay. when the coffee shop got too busy because then we actually could like you know we, we had like you know but forward and backwards but we did but we could if we were doing our time way properly it would not hit the sides of the you know the stove and the countertop oh good yeah yeah I really fun you guys, time. you guys <laughs> came to you guys came to beijing a few years ago that's where i met you and uh, jesse and we, we we went around what was that trip about and was that your first time that was my first time to Beijing. It was my second time to China. Um, I had been, I, I, I had gone to China um, ooh, back in 2008. Actually, um, I, when, when, I, when I finished university and I'd been studying Mandarin for a couple of, or for a, a, a year there for a couple of semesters, um, very coincidentally, I, when I finished university, there was a, um, a exchange, excuse me, an exchange program at the Shanghai Zhongyi Dashui for okay. uh, sorry, the Shanghai Chinese Medicine University, for those who don't speak Mandarin, um, where it was a language study program, but it was at the Chinese Medicine University in Shanghai. Uh, and so, you know, my whole motivation for learning Mandarin was for, to study Chinese medicine. So I, and it was like remarkably cheap. It was like, I think it was like 1200 bucks all in for um, over a month of an exchange. So I took that and that was my, that was my first time in China. Um, but uh, the trip to Beijing was, oh man, it was like, it was such a flying visit. And like, we were only there for, I want to say, six days. Mm. Um, it was, you know, way, 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 way too short a time to spend in a place like Beijing, of course, yeah. um, or anywhere really. But it was such a, it, it, it came about because, you know, I guess the, you know, it was right before New Year's, right? It was like, um, it was, I want to say, like a week or two prior to uh, Lunar New Year. Mm. And um, Yusin, and um, he was going back there because um, uh, his wife, my, 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 my Shumu, she, uh, her, they were going back to see her sister, I believe. So they were going back there. And while he was there, he was going to see his teacher, of course, because he always would when he was, goes back to Beijing. And he was just telling us about this one day and Jesse was up. Jesse lives down in, uh, in Washington, right? Yeah. So he's pretty close to Victoria. He's like, you know, it's like a, like a, like a half day trip to get from where he is to Victoria. Mm. So he was coming up pretty regularly at the time. So he was up one time and we're sitting around the coffee shop kind of, you know, on a break from training and, um, young yeah, was talking about, you know, Oh yeah, go to, I'll be going to, to China again in January and, you know, go and do this and you guys should come. Um, you know, right. gone back to China a handful of times, but this was the first time he said, you guys should come. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. So there was a, you know, um, you know, and it, it's funny to think back on it because it was like, for what was going on in my, you know, my, my, my like personal and professional life at the time, it was the worst possible time to have <laughs> had that opportunity come up. And I, always credit Jesse with this because Jesse is just one of those people who says the hell with it. I'm going to do this. Yeah. And 
literally made like he literally like bought me the ticket and said no you're coming <laughs> oh that's awesome man um you know because i was you know I, I i was like oh, okay like i really want to go but i just i just got to see like if i i i just i had just started working at the 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 chinese medicine college i was starting to train for like the the dean position for the program so i had this like rather you know high responsibility job that I was like, I'd started like a, a matter of months earlier. And, yeah. and I don't know, I, I, I was finding a lot of reasons to make it harder than it probably actually would have been. Right. Um, and, and so Jesse was like, no, 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 no. This is like, this is an opportunity that you, you know, like we, we don't have an option of saying no to this Rory. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and, and he was right. So we, you know, he basically strong armed me into, you know, actually, you know, coming up with a solution. <laughs> oh, very cool. And uh, yeah, and then we were in, so so we, so the, 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 we went, the whole point of the trip for us was to meet Bisha and actually, um, you know, meet the, like, you know, the older generation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I said, it was a, maybe six days. I think we, we were, we were there. Like, I think I was back in Victoria, like, you know, a week later, maybe eight days later with all the yeah. travel and everything. And, but it was one of those, it was one of those trips where, like, you know, there was a before and then there was an after. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. And did you meet yeah. a lot of the other practitioners there? Uh, yeah, we did. We met the whole family. Um, there was, uh, I want to say, 10 to 12 other practitioners, um, all, all of whom had started training under Bishriya, like, years after uh, Yang Lusha had left, uh, left Beijing. So they were kind of all, like, his junior brothers and sisters by like yeah. quite a few years yeah. um but yeah i know we, we we met the whole gong fu family we met uh be sure like be sure he is like I, you know like I, like family family mm. um we got to eat a whole lot of duck got to you know yeah. got to meet dilao surely right? <laughs> yeah 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 you know it was like it was That's... this you know as, as as my as my wife put it at the time it was me it was the kung fu vision quest um <laughs> It was, <laughs> and, you know, and it was this really funny trip because Jesse and I had arrived there uh, uh, two or three days earlier than um, than Yang Shifu had, so we had a few days just to chill in the hutongs. Um, yeah, and you know, so we were doing that, and, you know, and that, and I think we we met up with you on like our second and or our third day. Yeah, and then oh no, I think we we met up with you one day, and then we went to go the next day. We went to go train with you and and Dilauscher. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, it's funny. I, st I still tell stories about that day about how cold my feet were. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I went to I went to Beijing in January expecting to do Gong Fu inside, so I didn't. So I bought I I, I brought my like indoor Feiyue shoes. Oh uh, no! <laughs> and then we were we were out in that courtyard. Um, which is funny. I, I whenever I see pictures of Dilauscher or or you, I, I see the courtyard and it brings back th these memories. Yeah. Um, um, I, and I just remember, like, my my feet feeling like they were just blocks of wood because like there was no feeling left in them. Yeah. And, but you know, under it, but but this was like you know what like the like this, like here I am in Beijing doing you know Xingyi and and and, and Bagua with Di Guoyang, you know like who cares that my feet are cold right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, you learn that the hard way with the, the footwear in winter and the different yes. seasons training outside and what you need to do and what you need to wear and how things change with the seasons. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like like I said, like in Victoria, we, we don't get it that cold in Victoria. What we get is the wet. So it's like you have to shield yourself against getting like, like just getting like literally saturated when you're outside. So you have to wear like waterproof footwear when you're training outside. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And yourself, are you are you teaching uh, Bagua at the moment? Um, apart from uh, your practice, yeah, I, I am. I am uh, technically. I I've been a um, a very on again, off again sort of teacher, but it's been the you know kind of the mandate in a in a very real way. Like like I said, we have a really small lineage, yeah. um, and so you know it's the like the 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 responsibility is like you know is to definitely go in and you know and and continue continue the the transmission of it through through time so it's sort of always been something that i um have been you know like 
flirting with the idea of a little bit. And, you know, people hear that you do Bagua and they're interested in it and stuff and you, you know, you, you teach people from time to time. Right. But um, I've historically not been a very, uh, what's the word for it? Like, I, 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 I kind of try, I, I've always tried to teach Bagua the way I was taught Bagua. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, like I said, when I, you know, I, I was like, I, I came to Bagua at a certain point in my martial arts training where what I was really looking for was like minimalism. Um, so, you know, it was great for me. You know, I, I, I guess I, I mentioned I came from this karate background and learned some shingy. And then um, my first lesson with Yusin was literally three hours of standing in John Zhuang with him kind of coming in to check in on me every like 20 minutes or so and saying like, yeah, yeah, not bad. And then, and then walking away. And it was awesome. <laughs> you know, it was like, that was exactly what I wanted. Yeah. Um, like it was, it was about a month before I even learned, learned Tang Nibu. Um, it was about another month before I learned Dan Huang Zhang. And, you know, and like, you know, and while he was doing this sort of online training program where people were kind of getting, you know, like another, like another, like one of the four animal changes or the next body change or something, which are like the Shantian portions or the next Hotian palm. We were filming that and I was seeing it, but when it came down to our training, he was, he, he was very emphatic on like, you know, that stuff's neat and all, but you guys really need to be grinding out your, your, like your circle walking and your single palm change. Um, like, you know, that same thing of that's the engine that makes everything else work. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and for myself and for Lee, the other local student, um, that was what we were, we were all about, and that was what we wanted to do. So our training was was always like you know you know even like at, you know like a actually a decade in, we would be meeting up at the coffee shop every Sunday and going through the same stuff we had learned on day one in the yeah, most well, that's detail. How it is. Yeah, that's totally how it right. Is. Yeah. So trying to um, make the you know, like find, you know, you know there, there's an expression and you're probably going to know the actual Mandarin for, but you know, like it's difficult, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult for a student to find a good teacher and it's difficult for a teacher to find a good student. Um, it's like, it's one of those things that you, you really need to have that, um, uh, that kind of magic formula sometimes. And, you know, there, there's like, what, what I, what I, I, I try to, I, I think I was almost like a little too, like almost orthodox about it for a number of years where I like, if someone expressed an interest in Bagua, like I, I, this sounds really silly when I say it now, but I actually had this like rule that they had to ask me three times before I would actually like oh, entertain really? them teaching them. And, and it was probably cause I'm like, you know, like you say you want to learn Bagua, but like, are you really going to want to learn like, like, like stand here for hours like this? And, you know, and like, I, like I, 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 I'm not saying this was a good thing. This is kind of me almost being like an arrogant martial artist in my earlier days. <laughs> in some ways, to be like, oh, you want to learn Bagua, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I had this idea in my mind that, you know, the we, we've been gifted this very complete, very, um, you know, like the, the the smallness of the lineage in some ways has made it so that it's been like the people who have been able to carry it forward have been carrying it forward in an extremely detailed, densely thorough kind of way. And it was always one of my concerns that to just start showing it like to anybody and everybody, it would start to like, you know, it, it, it would either like, you know, would, would start to water it down or it would make me start to water down my own understanding of it because oh, I, I was like starting to try and just make it so it was like accessible for anybody and everybody. Right, right. Okay. And, um, you know, and, and I think that I went too far in that direction for a very long period of time. And, uh, and so, you know, long, long story short is I've got one student. <laughs> Oh, okay. So you are teaching something. <laughs> yes, yeah, I've got yes. one student who, for probably the last, I want to say, four or five years, has every so often like sent me messages, being like, "Hey, Rory, I really want to do Bagua again. Can we meet up?" Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and you know, and, and and we've been a lot more active in our and and in in, in it for the last couple of like the last few years, I've been trying to make more of a concerted effort to actually like become a bit more active as a as as a teacher and as an instructor. Um, you know, for, for one, because I kind of sort of got over my, whatever my hangup was about, about, you know, teaching it correctly. Um, as well as, you know, like, uh, young, young Shifu basically said, like, you know, like, you know, he kind of lay it, lay it down to us and, uh, like, you guys have to start actually doing this yourself too. You have to start, to start, to start teaching it. Like, you know, you can't just, <laughs> right. 
right, can't just right. you know keep it all to yourself sometimes. Um, uh, and so, yeah, and I, I, you, know, so you, you kind of, I mean, in some ways, and I don't know if I'm fully there yet because I don't think I've had the chance to be um, really make this call on myself yet, but you kind of find yourself sort of like like maturing in the in the art to the point where you're actually like capable of being an okay teacher at it. Yeah. Um, and I think that I'm maybe coming to that point, um, you know, because I feel like I'm I'm not quite as uh as like you know crotchety about it as I used to be. But you know, <laughs> yeah. And, and and like like you were saying earlier, different people are going to come to it with different goals, and you know, there's something to be said for disseminating it at all um, and having there be like some awareness of it and then having there be like the people who really want to go the distance with it and sometimes you need to actually you know like cast a bit of a wider net to you know alert people the people who are really wanting to go to the depths with it that it's even exists in the first place um so yeah so I, i've started to try and become a bit more active as a teacher um but you know i i, I in, in other ways i feel like i i have sort of the benefit of because like um I, you know, it's it's still very it's very very small time that you know I I am able to spend a lot of time with very small you know small numbers of people and you know we don't we we just we train outside like you know as you know as as you do so it's easy to kind of you, you don't have to like like running a commercial bagua school or something like that would always be a really big challenge because all of a sudden you're trying to like you you're, you you sort of talk about the art a little bit differently in order to you know attract like a quota of students to make the rent or something like that right. and that and that can be a that can be a challenging thing so i feel like i'm kind of fortunate in that i don't have to do that i can kind of let the art speak for itself sure sure that and, is a, that is a good thing i mean it makes you focus on that and that's it really. yeah exactly exactly you know but there's there's so much in there right and i think this is the thing that i've been really realizing personally is that there is so much in the system and different people are going to uh you know, like have they're going to they're going to uh, you know like like resonate with different aspects of it. They're going to be looking for different things that you know asking a different question than I was that Bagua has an answer for. You know, like for for me, it was like I I wanted to learn you know an old school martial art. Like I like I mean that was where my mind was at when I was I was looking around for things like this. Was I wanted to find you know what I think, I don't know, I, I wouldn't have used this terminology at the time, but I wanted to find, you know, like a, uh, um, like a, uh, an intact martial arts from the pre comp, you know, like, like, like pre UFC era, basically. Yeah, <laughs> pre-modern. Sorry? Yeah. Pre-modern martial arts era. Pre-modern, yeah. Like I, I had a conviction that, you know, if a martial art had lasted this long, it had to have been legit. It may just not be understood by people currently practicing it, which is why it doesn't seem to work or something. But I had it in my mind that no, like traditional martial arts are like extremely legitimate martial arts. You just have to find the the right source material. Exactly. Um, but you know, some people come to Bagua because they like the movement qualities of it, right? Some people come because they um, they're interested in. Um, you know, like they're like they're 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 interested in it for just more, almost more of like a like you know, like like a like you know, like so, like like a physical practice. Like they don't want to, you know, step into a you know like like a they don't they don't want to cross hands with people basically, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like that, that that may not be the thing that attracts them to something like Bagua. And I I've, I've learned that you know you 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 can teach one without the other, and that's okay. Um, you know, and like. Yeah. You, you you have to you have to find you know, at least a couple of people to you know to give the whole thing to but it's not a bad thing to have someone who learns the xian tian really really well and you know and is aware of the ho tian but it's just not much of a scrapper and that's okay like that's you know th th you know it takes a whole lineage or a whole generation of people to carry an art forward in, in its uh in, in its in its fullest form so you kind of need to have different people with different emphases i think well, yeah, I mean, that's that's very true. So um, you've got your practice going and you've got your your um, I mean, your medical practice and you, your your teaching. I mean, you've got one student, but I mean, I'm sure if there's people that want to get in contact with you to learn, then then you consider it. So, oh, yeah, 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 I am. At, I am. I am. Uh, as the weather gets a little bit nicer out here, I'm hoping to start up, uh, um, you know, re resume a, a regular Saturday morning practice in, in the, the park next to my house here and um, 
Yeah, look, yeah, and it's it's funny. It, it struck me the other day that I'm actually the I, I am right now the age that uh, Yusin was when I met him. <laughs> oh, okay. It's funny. I, I was watching. I was showing my student and um, uh, an old video that I, I just found it on my computer, and when he was. You know, he, we were we were training at the clinic actually, because um, it's I, there's a very nice big spacious area at the clinic, and you know, in true Jizong fashion, we had pushed aside all the furniture and we're training in you know my place of work, <laughs> uh, and and I and I was finding him on my computer, and I found this old video of of Yang Yusin doing um, the four animal Shantian changes from yeah. back in I want to say 2008. Uh, which was he basically filmed it to put up for that online course, and I remember this video from when I first met him, and you know it was one of those funny things because I remember watching the video at the time, and you know, and that's that's my teacher, that's what he looks like, and and then of course I'm watching it now, and I'm like, man, yeah, he was like that was that was a minute ago, like he's you know, he's a very youthful guy still, but you know like, you can tell like it, this was like you know 15 years ago that he was filming yeah. this, yeah. and then I kind of stopped for a second, I did the math, and I'm like, he's. He's my age, like I'm. I'm that old right now, <laughs> as he is right. in this video, and it just had this funny kind of feeling of like you know the like I, I and and that was when Yusin had actually kind of said, okay, I'm going to actually start trying to teach this now. He was about you know just just about to hit forty, um, and you know and it had kind of been given the this like the strong arm from his teacher saying like you know you have to start teaching this, and it could occur to me of like. All right, I've been given the strong arm by my teacher. I'm hitting that point in, you know, my my age. Like I think I need to actually start putting more effort into, you know, making this about the transmission of the art and not just about my own understanding of it. Yeah, yeah. So gonna to try to be a little bit more active in, in in that regard. Well, that's very good. That's very good. Um I I don't want to keep you for the whole day. Um we're we're also getting getting close to a couple of things that I've got to get off to and it's sure, been great sure. talking to you. We could do this again in the future. Um, I'm hopefully that you um, I'm hoping that you put something together in terms of penning your uh, discoveries out and as they relate to your understanding of Chinese medicine. But um, what I'll do is we'll put your contact details in the notes for the for the for the podcast. So if anybody's looking at to get in contact with you, whether it's for Chinese medicine or for Bagua, then they'll be able to. So we'll, we'll do all that. Sure. Yeah, that sounds great. All right. Well, it's been great chatting to you. Um, I hope you keep yeah. well where you're at, and yeah, we'll be in touch soon. Of course, and you know, and like, thanks so much for having me on the show. I, I mean, kind of like I, as Jesse was sort of echoing too. Like, I mean, I, I'm in in many, many, many ways just kind of a quiet, small time martial artist in a small corner of uh, of Canada here. So, you know, going through your like the the old episodes of your show and kind of seeing the the, the very uh, you know, recognizable names of people. It was a big surprise to um, get the invite and deeply honored, deeply no, no, no. deeply no, no, no. The honor's all mine. So yeah, thanks to Jesse for putting us in contact and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch soon. So. Sounds good, Byron. Thanks so much and have a good rest of your day. You too, you too. Bye for now. Okay, bye.